Basically, I'm, I'm going to teach you the magic formula that I discovered that helped me scale our business. And um, you know, I think you'll find it interesting because it might contextualize a lot of the information you're hearing here and um, for those that are going to Traffic Conversion Summit, what, what you might hear there. Uh, so uh, basically, I started in 2000. I discovered a product that I thought had a lot of potential but wasn't being marketed very well, which was a language learning product called Pimsleur. And so I started... Um, started marketing that and you know it took a number of years it's not an overnight success story but uh, but basically was able to turn that into the number two brand in the market so behind uh, Rosetta Stone and this is I have a um, I still have this company but uh, I I now work in a different company but so I there's a lot of lessons learned though that are they're very applicable um, so basically Started this company, built it up to 85 million. We were on the Inc. 5000 for seven years in a row. Uh, Philly 100, Internet Retailers Top 500. Um, I think if we had known that that award existed, we probably would have been on there for a decade. I mean, just a very high, rapid growth company. So, I mean, just to give some comparison, a snapshot back, I mean, this is an older slide. 2012, uh, we were about 75% the size of Rosetta Stone's online consumer-focused business. So they had a number of different areas they focused on from international. Oh, Stroll, the, the best parent company of Pimsleur? Yeah, so Pimsleur Approach, the brand we have, is, is under Stroll. So basically, uh, really quick, how I did it. One of the big things was deciding I wanted a corporate company instead of a lifestyle business. I mean, that's a key distinction. If you don't no, you want one and you do the other, or vice versa, you're miserable. So it's really important to be clear on that. That's a really good point. You should stop on that. I mean, I find so many people, can you elaborate a little more? Okay, so basically the thing is, is you have to go through, like, I, I, I don't know, it, for some people it's two years, for some people it's four years, but basically you end up spending all your profit hiring certain people just to get back to where you were, but then you have leverage. Does that make sense? Um, so it's kind of like now that I'm in a different position, I mean, I spent, I have a new company and um, I invested millions of dollars making sure I had generals around me because I knew they could build out the organization underneath it. And so, but this is a totally different approach. But you have to build your way up when you're first starting. You just don't have the capital to be able to do that kind of stuff. So. Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's a lot of people. They think they want to have this staff, this team, this responsibility, but at the end of the day, they just don't want to, it's just, it's a lot of complication. I mean, especially if you can have a great lifestyle, especially today, digital business, live anywhere in the world. I mean, you know, what the hell? I mean, I live, I live in Colombia. I live in uh, South America. My wife's Colombian, so we moved there six, seven months ago. I mean, I live a three hundred fifty thousand dollar lifestyle on seventy thousand bucks a month. I mean seventy thousand. Excuse me, seventy thousand dollars a year. <laughs> Different country. Seventy thousand dollars a year, and I mean, I, I just. California, and you can live a three hundred fifty thousand dollar lifestyle on seventy thousand a month. Exactly. Exactly. Actually, even less, even more, right? It's more like ninety. I mean, but uh, yeah. So, so, you know, it, it's a, it's important to be clear on that. Uh, the other thing is just, I mean, really quick, investing in knowledge. I mean, being here is an example of that. Um, building a great team. I mean, it sounds like such a cliche, but uh, uh, I, I remember um, I won uh, Entrepreneur of the uh, Ernst and Young Entrepreneur of the Year award, and. Uh, it felt like such a cliche, but I basically said, look, it's, it's my team. I am blessed to have a great team around me because you get to do what you're really good at and they can do what they're good at. And it's just, it's just amazing when you can make that happen. Uh, the other thing is building a great network. And one of the interesting things about a network, especially with you guys being in the same industry, is that if somebody's testing something, you can get direct insight into um, what they've done and try to apply it to your business. And so I always felt like over time that was able, I was able to just stack these things on top of each other, uh, which just accelerated our growth. So we always had new ideas and proven ideas where you knew you could put a data point. If you had to compare 10 ideas, you knew this one got this guy a 30% lift, this one got this guy a 15% lift. 
And you could just at least rationalize which, rationalize which one to prioritize a lot better. So that was, very, that was very helpful. And then finally, discovering the magic formula, which I'm going to teach you guys. So the magic formula has two parts. And part one is, is contribution margin. And I'll explain this concept. Basically, contribution margin is like, is like um, uh, I guess, what Einstein did for physics. I mean, you think about a simple formula that led to a lot of um, positive and negative creations. Uh, contribution margin is kind of like that. And most simplistically, revenue minus variable cost equals contribution margin. And one of the interesting things is if you go to Wikipedia and you look this up, I mean, I don't know. This reminds me of mumbo jumbo I learned in accounting classes in, in college. And I just feel that it's such a shame that a concept like this is taught in such a complex way that people can't leverage it every day. Because uh, contribution margin, I mean, understanding what that is and how it's calculated, I think is the difference between um, you know, being able to scale a large business and not, because you understand what metric to focus on. So I'll, I'll explain it here. I, this is, this is uh, from a slide presentation I've given to employ, our employees in the past. And basically, this is um, it's a story about Big Joe and his uh, burger shack. So the idea is we got this nice, big, juicy burger. We sell it for five bucks. You know, the multiple patties and goodies all cost about three bucks. So if you sell it for five, it costs you three you make $2. So that's what's left from each sale for, pay, for payroll and expenses. Uh, pretty simple. So how many burgers does it take to pay Mama Jo? So she gets paid 800 bucks a month. And how many burgers do you have to sell to be able to pay her 800 bucks a month? Well, you're making two bucks a piece. If you sell 400, you can pay her 800. It's very simple. So what about paying the rent? Rent's a thousand bucks a month. You're making two dollars a burger. You got to sell five hundred to be able to pay the thousand bucks. Again, very very simple concept fundamentally. So in in our company, this was kind of our profit and loss, so income statement, P and L hierarchy, and all the way to here gets you to contribution margin. And this is nothing that you're not seeing on your financial statements. I mean, but it's all how you organize it, right? So you've got gross sales, you have cancellations. If you have subscription programs, people call in before they, um, uh, they, that you ship out, so they'll cancel something. You have your returns. That leaves you with kind of your net revenue. Then you take out your product costs. Some people pay royalties, whether it's a celebrity or content or whatever. So you take out your royalty costs. You take out your advertising costs. If you're in a business that offers installment billing, uh, that's something that that's an innovation that we brought to the uh, language learning space, where we had um, $256 courses that we let people pay in four installments of $59. So anybody that doesn't pay you the bad debt would be your default cost, and that would go here. And then kind of your shipping, the cost, uh, the, the the labels and so forth is your fulfillment costs and credit card processing costs would go out there. Now you can take this to another level and get more sophisticated where if you can actually figure out what your call center costs are and your warehouse costs if you have that yourself, you can put those there too. Um, and the idea is that all of these vary with each product sold. That's why it's called a variable cost. So anyways, Take all that out, this is your, this, this, this is your contribution margin. O operating expenses is just overhead, you know, payroll, rent, that kind of stuff. And then you get to operating profit. And basically, this is the way I explain it, that's what's left over for shareholders. Um, but that's how you get there. And so I'll, I'll explain in, in simple examples how this is just really powerful to organize it this way. Because I find that a lot of companies optimize to the wrong metric. It's kind of like, metric of the month. So one of my, f <laughs> I, I was at a, a mastermind a couple days ago and um, kind of called out one of my friends who had a really awesome idea about how he incentivized his employees on like, he's like, all right, if we hit for this month this specific gross revenue number, you're going to get everybody in the company is getting an extra week's pay. And so we found for like months, like he's getting record sales and all this other stuff. But the problem is, is that's the wrong metric. It's irrelevant. It's like, what's the profitability of that? I mean, you're just, so many companies focus on the wrong metrics. 